It's an incredible story of an incredible car. And it all starts at India Gate in New Delhi. So Sumit, here we are. Uh, nice uh, busy weekend. A lot of tourists around here at uh, India Gate. Really the first time uh, we are doing something so, uh, let's say, epic uh, with a made in India car. That's right. You know, uh, I think this is, this is a very uh, proud moment because uh, Quid, uh, you know, when got launched in India, uh, it is the biggest make in India story. Renault being an 118 year old uh, brand for the first time in its history has launched a global car outside of Europe. What more to say than to, uh, to make this drive, you know, all the way from New Delhi, the India gate, to, to Paris. And with that, we set off. With support vehicle in tow, a Renault Duster AWD, our little quid one liter made light work of the first day, thanks to the pristine Yamuna Expressway. That couldn't be said about the next few days, as the roads got narrower and the drivers more unruly. Through UP and West Bengal, we trudged along until finally we reached Gohati. From here, we ventured further northeast on what would be the last stretch of our first leg. We're here now in Dimapur in the northeast at what is almost the end of the Indian leg of our epic journey. Now, it may be familiar territory and only a fraction of the distance that we're going to be travelling, but actually it's very significant and that's all down to this car right here. You see, the Renault Quid has taken the subcontinent by storm and there's no better evidence of this than the sheer number of them that we've seen on the road on our journey from New Delhi to here. The drive from Dimapur to our last night stop in India, Imphal, was a breeze. And then it was a lazy, hazy crawl on some gorgeous but narrow farm roads leading into the mountains and onward to More, the Indian side of the border with Myanmar. The customs and immigration process was a friendly and personal experience, so different from what you used to at an airport. Well, we've actually reached a very monumental part of this drive and that's because Shapur Kotwal has joined us from Imphal. Hi Shapur, welcome to the drive. And no, the real reason why it's a very monumental part of the drive is that we've made our first international border crossing. That's right, we've crossed over from India to Myanmar and it's a rather special border crossing, right Shapur? Yeah, it's, it's very different. First of all, it's the only place where you can drive out of India practically and it's unique because you come from a right-hand drive country, India, and you go on to a left-hand drive country, but there's no real demarcation. You just got to do it naturally. Myanmar was green, scenic and wet. The Quid's big wiper was working overtime to keep the windscreen spotless. Visiting a new country for the first time was a thrill for sure. Yet driving through Myanmar, I couldn't help but notice that we Indians have quite a lot in common with them. There are quite a few cultural similarities between the people of India and the people of Myanmar. Uh, for instance, uh, they do like to chew their pan like we do. Uh, and the men do wear a garment similar to a lungi, uh, for instance. Now, while I'm not prepared to do either of those at this point, I will try and fit in with the local culture by wearing this hat for as long as I can. Looks kind of nice, doesn't it? However, what we realize soon enough is that the majority of cars here are right-hand drive. So the locals are driving on the right-hand side of the road in right-hand drive cars. So if they're used to it, I think we can do it too, right? Okay, now as cool as this hat is, it's not making driving very easy. So I think I'm going to have to get rid of it for now. Driving on the right-hand side wasn't the only challenge. The roads in Myanmar were narrow, mucky and layered with all manner of potholes. And though the quid's 180mm of ground clearance helped, 
we have to be on our toes to keep a steady and heady pace. The drive to our last stop in Myanmar, Lashio, was a relatively short 214 kilometers, so we took it easy, stopping to shoot the quid against some of the many stunning backdrops in this gorgeous country. Apart from an incredibly ornate stupa with a gold dome and intricate mirror mosaic work, we also tried our hands, or rather feet, at futsal with a ball made of wound cane with some of the locals. The next day was a long drive to the Chinese border on roads that were mostly covered in muck. We started slow, but after a point, things opened up. Still, the rubbish weather and mucky roads followed us all the way to the border, where we simply pulled up into a very large building, finished the paperwork and crossed into China. What awaited us on the other side was a revelation. And as the little Renault's tires went from wet mud to perfectly set tarmac, we didn't just cross countries, it felt like we crossed through time. The buildings are vast and grand, adorned fastidiously with colourful neon lights, and the roads are wide and well labelled, and there's even a good amount of greenery. After 10 days of rural India and Myanmar, even we had to recalibrate our brains a little bit. But suffice to say, our stomachs had no trouble adjusting to the incredible new cuisine. Daytime brought with it a chance to clean all the Myanmari muck off our cars. Yes, seeing the quid glistening in all its glory once again was rather cathartic. The day's plan was to reach Dali, and that gave us our first taste of the superbly built Chinese expressways. So finally, we're out from the absolutely destroyed and potholed roads of Myanmar, the sort of rally stages, the WRC stages, and we've come onto this shockingly brilliant section of expressway simply unreal and the quid is just lapping it up she's building up speed she's keeping up with other cars beautifully the one liter really does make a difference and we can tell on this long drive with 400 kilometers to go today we've left the border town of Ruili pretty early you skim along the top of these mountains and there's viaducts every few minutes there's tunnels and the scenery is just stunning we're just having a brilliant time just watching the road go by of course a bit more speed would be great. The limit here is 120, so we've got to stay well within that because you never know how strict they are. It was smooth sailing all the way, interrupted only by a rather long lunch break, which was actually thanks to the quid. You see, no one in China had ever seen this car before, and understandably, they were very curious about it. So, of course, we thought it best to show it off a bit. Back on the road, the easy expressway finally gave way to city lights as we entered the modest lake town of Dali. The perfectly still Dali lake at dawn the next day made for a picture-perfect backdrop, not just for us, but for the rather curious locals as well. Several pictures later, we left and found our way to the 1,500-year-old ancient city. Well, we've got a very long drive ahead of us today, over 600 kilometers from the town of Dali, which is just over there, to the city of Shichang, which I hope I've pronounced properly. But we couldn't leave without visiting this. It is the magnificent ancient city centered around those three pagodas you see back there. It was built over 1,300 years ago in the Tang Dynasty, and it stands maintained even today. Hastening ourselves away from Dali, we expected to make quick work of the drive to Xichang. However, yes, the infamous Chinese freeway traffic jam. The amazing four-laner came to a complete standstill, and it was only an hour later that the traffic cleared up, finally allowing us to get a chance to let the energetic puppy inside the quid loose again. The drive to Chengdu the next day was a collection of numbers. Our highway gave us a glimpse of the 24,790 feet tall Gongga Peak. Through another mountain goes the Niba Shan Tunnel, an incredible 10 kilometers long. At 181 meters, there's also the world's tallest support pillar for a bridge. 
and our journey crosses the 5000 km mark thankfully a day of rest awaits us in chengdu but first the quid needed some special attention we had to swap out our chair summer tires which have brought us over 5000 km from new delhi all the way to chengdu to a set of Chayat winter tires which will take us on the rest of our journey. And the reason for that is as of tomorrow we will be encountering some seriously frigid weather and we have to be prepared for that. You see tires are actually one of the most important parts on a car. They are the only point of contact between you and the road, but they are often very very sadly overlooked. We thought we'd spend the next day having a quiet poke around Chengdu city, but alas, that just wasn't to be. Wherever we took the quid, the locals thronged, armed with questions about the car and completely in awe of our Herculean journey. Leaving Chengdu behind, we then hopped back onto the superb expressway for another long blast. And as the altitude rose, the temperature began to drop. Well, we've just left the big city of Chengdu out into the countryside and up into the mountains and as you can see, it's gotten quite cold. Uh, we stopped here at a motorway service area just to get a quick bite to eat and as you can probably tell, there's a lot of people around out here today because it's the weekend. A couple of hours later, the expressway gave way to a smaller national highway. Things were now starting to get decidedly rural. We passed through many small villages and because we were quite close to the Tibetan border at this point, everything around us was a mix of the two cultures. In fact, even the road signs were labelled in both Chinese and Tibetan. Now, I'm not sure if you can tell from this angle, but we have clearly left the expressways behind us right now and we are up in the mountains on a national highway in China uh, on our way to Shakhe uh, and to get there we are passing through these lovely barren grasslands that quite frankly remind me a lot of the Moray plains on the way up to Ladakh. The thing is though, we are also seeing a lot of snow covered mountains right now and the temperatures are already in single digits and they might drop below zero at some point and we are sure to see a bit of snow today. The thing about these roads are they aren't quite as wide or as big or as fast as the expressways that we encountered earlier but they are certainly a whole lot more enjoyable and a far prettier sight. The views here are just captivating. Personally, on the time that I've had with it on this trip, what I've clearly noticed is that while the old, while the 800cc version is great for fuel economy, what it lacked was that little extra pep. Uh, and that kind of pep is what you need out here on the highway when you're making big, big progress like this on such a long journey. And yeah, that's exactly what this car needed and that's exactly what it's got with this one litre version. Rahul, what do you think about the, the new engine? Even I'm really surprised, I mean, even on the expressway that we drove on, the mountain roads, although it's gradual, the climb, but surprisingly, it's just keeping up with all the cars, overtaking is pretty easy. It's just comfortable. There you go. Would you have thought that a little city car like the Renault Quid could tackle not just our own highways but the highways of so many countries as well? We've been through a whole lot of China so far and it hasn't skipped a beat. Fantastic new engine. The amazing scenery continued and before the day's drive was over, we had climbed all the way to 3500 meters above sea level. And yes, suffice to say, things were about to get way colder. Greetings from the wild and frigid hinterland of China. Now, as you can probably tell, we've left the big cities and infrastructure far behind and below us. Look at this place, it's gorgeous. We're at about 4,000 meters above sea level and about minus 10 degrees. So you'll have to bear with me if I keep this a little bit brief. The thing is, we've been starting every morning at these ridiculous sub-zero temperatures and the quid has fired up perfectly every single time. If you want to talk to test the car, this is how you go about doing it. And let me just tell you, this is one tough little tyke. Despite my infantile colleagues ruining my serious effect at presenting this show in the middle of a blizzard, I'll have to admit, there's nothing quite like a snowball fight.
And some photographs and a few shenanigans in the quid later, we are back on our way. Well, we've driven through about 3,200 kilometers of China and finally we've encountered our first truly, truly bad road. This is exactly opposite of what we've been driving so far. Only expressways and now this. It's basically no tarmac at all, just a bunch of rocks and stones and a pretty torn up piece of, I don't know if you can call this a road, but it is a road and it is the way we have to go for now. So we just have to make do with it. However, the going only got tougher from there and little did we know we would soon be on possibly the most treacherous road on this entire journey. The surface deteriorated into a mix of mud and sludge peppered with pockets of snow. We also started to climb quite quickly and the next thing we knew we were atop a narrow mountain pass, tires deep in the thick snow with a sheer drop down the side. We relied on nerves of steel, a smooth throttle and faith in the cars and the tires ability to pull through and pull through they did. All that ground clearance isn't just for show. Once our hearts had moved from our mouths back down into our chests, we descended the mountain range on an absolutely demolished road that would be right at home in India or Myanmar and made our way to Jia Yugyan. The next day's drive started with a visit to a monument that some of you might recognize. Well now we couldn't have possibly driven all the way through China and not stopped here for a quick visit. It is of course the Great Wall of China and well if it doesn't look as grand and majestic as it does in some of the photos that's because it's not the famous part of the Great Wall of China. This is actually the western end of the Great Wall of China. This is where it finishes and it was built a little later than the main part that you know. It was built by the Han Dynasty about 1800 years ago of course to keep the Mongolians out. Now that means it's a hundred percent Chinese localized and our quid? Well, it's 98% Indian localized and that's not too bad, is it? Mercifully, the superb 120 kph expressways were back and the next 600 kilometers went by in a flash. And as you can probably tell, we also had put the snow behind us. We were now surrounded by sand and rocks on our way to the Gobi Desert. But first, a rather interesting stop at quite a big landmark in the Turpan Basin. You know, it's hard to believe that just two days ago, we were on the top of a mountain having a snowball fight in minus 14 degrees centigrade and at 4,300 meters above sea level. And today, well, we're in the middle of essentially a desert. It's plus 15 degrees centigrade and we're 154.3 meters below sea level. Yes, that actually makes this the lowest point inland in the world. And that just goes to show the incredible diversity you see in this massive and beautiful country of China, which unfortunately we will be leaving in the next few days. It's been an incredible journey across this country so far and well, I hope the last few days are as interesting as the past two weeks have been. Finally, we made our way to Kashgar, the last city in China before the Kyrgyz border. An important trading stop on the Silk Road, Kashgar is home to a number of cultures with Chinese, Central Asian, Middle Eastern and European influences. Kashgar suddenly takes me back to India. It's absolutely chaotic. There's so much traffic. Uh, cars darting in and out without indicating. Uh, random intersections popping out out of nowhere. Cattle on the streets even. It kind of feels like home after a long spell of not being at home. And well, that's an interesting way to say goodbye to this magnificent country of China. Uh, because even the people, the architecture, the language is all changing right now. It's getting altogether more Middle Eastern and a little bit Russian as well. So it's unlike anything we've ever experienced in China so far. And that's a refreshing change, I suppose. A slightly late departure meant that we were behind schedule at the Chinese border. But thankfully, immigration and customs went by in a flash with typical Chinese efficiency. What was a bit unusual was that the Kyrgyzstan side of the border was over 100 kilometers away. That means 100 kilometers of no man's land. This included the Torugat Pass, once a fearsome and treacherous road, but today, all that threatened us was some chilly wind. Our 
After a night in the town of Naren, we drove to Kyrgyzstan's capital, Bishkek, and were welcomed by super-sized skewers of shaslik and even a local wedding. But through the merriment, it's clear that a chapter of this incredible journey was about to close, as some of us would be heading back home. On the whole, it's been, it has been an incredible journey. It's uh, really fascinating to see how the people change, how the culture changes, how the cuisine changes. It's really amazing how the quiz has been doing so far. It's seen everything. Well, it's a cold night here in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. It's also a very sad night for me because tomorrow I get on a plane and fly back to Mumbai because this is the end of my journey. Well, what an incredible 10,000 kilometers it's been in the quid. So clearly, this is the point at which Nikhil Bhatia takes over. <laughs> we are going to really interesting places. We're going to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Uh, we will be entering Russia and we'll be going to places which you don't really hear about and then onwards into Europe and then finally Paris. Oh, my God.